will plunge into church history. Um, and you remember the last couple of times we've been together, we were talking about Cyprian of Carthage because he was an active fellow who was involved in multiple arguments. Um, the question of what to do with those who fell away during persecution and then came back wanting to be restored. And then also the question of baptism. Whose baptism can be accepted as valid and whose baptism has to be judged as not a baptism at all. So people coming to us from those backgrounds actually need to be baptized on the profession of their faith. Well, of course, events in the wider world are not just on hold while Cyprian deals with these things. There was a window after the Decian persecution, which we talked about, um, during which there was a little bit of back and forth with the empire in terms of persecution. Um, in the year 257, the Emperor Valerian was facing a very difficult situation. Um, the, uh, the, from, from the Roman perspective, the barbarians, the Franks, the Alemanni, um, the Goths, had, were causing trouble along the Rhine and had invaded what they called the province of Dacia, which is roughly somewhere around the area of Albania, as we would think of it today. And then in the east, the Neo-Persian Empire was causing a lot of problems for Rome. You remember we talked about the oldest Christian church that has been found so far was found at a city called Dura Europos on the Euphrates River. Well, at this time with the Persians, it fell after a heroic defense. And in fact, even Antioch left Roman control for a while and was under control by Persians. Well, Valerian is facing all these problems, and since the Decian persecution, the church had been growing. The number of bishoprics doubled or close to it. Um, people were flocking into the church right and left, especially in the east. Um, the church was coming to be considered a reliable institution. You could leave money to them for them to distribute for charitable purposes, and they execute the will, etc. In other words, they were seen as being a stable, a reliable, a trustworthy place to deal with this sort of thing, but that also meant they were rising into prominence. You start to have more Christians in higher ranks of government and that kind of thing. And you can trace this archaeologically in some ways. You can trace it through inscriptions, burial inscriptions, where inscriptions to pagan deities stop and now all the inscriptions are Christians. They talk about how the person who was buried was a soldier of Christ or something along those lines. You can trace it from the fact that where before people were having stones carved with an inscription to whatever the particular deity of the locality was or whatever particular deity they had in mind, a few years later, four or five years after the date of that inscription, that inscribed stone has now been turned into a paving stone. In other words, nobody cares anymore. There's no religious value to them anymore. Now it's just paving material. And in its place come Christian inscriptions. And this was going on in North Africa, in rural Egypt, and in Syria, perhaps particularly, were areas where there was particular growth. We talked about Gregory the Wonder Worker, Gregory Thaumaturgus, going to Neo Caesarea and finding only 17 Christians, and by the end of his life, 30 years later, the claim being made that now there were only 17 non Christians, which sounds a little too symmetrical to be quite plausible, doesn't it? But even if it's a rhetorical figure, even if it's just something to say, it's clear that he had a big impact in that part of the world. Well, as all of this is going on, and Valerian is facing all of these problems, particularly from Egyptian priests, there starts to be a lot of pressure of, hey, these Christians are getting too big for their britches. Um, and perhaps even a thought, you know, we could take the money that they have, and we could use it to fund the wars that we have to be fighting on three fronts against the Persians, against the barbarians, quote unquote, along the Rhine, and to restore or reconquer the province of Dacia. So you could see where a prosperous and a growing church 
seems like a juicy target. And Valerian allowed himself to be talked into it. Now it started with just a requirement that senior clergy participate in some sacred rite. And when they refused, as many of them did, they got booted, um, but most of them got booted to fairly nice places. Dionysus of Alexandria got booted and started to evangelize the Libyans. Um, Cyprian was exiled, but his exile was kind of like to a resort town. So, you know, if I were exiled to Hawaii, I don't know how upset I'd be about it. I mean, you know, you're upset because you've been forced to go, but on the other hand, things could be a lot worse, right? Well, that was kind of, he got sent off to the seacoast, to one of the North African inlets there. But as time went by, things got more serious. Cyprian was recalled. He was accused of having led for a long time an irreligious life and sort of directed an illegal association of people. And so he was put to death. Um, the Bishop of Rome, Sixtus or Zistus, depending on whose spelling you take for that one, he and four of his deacons were captured in the catacombs and were executed. It, it started to heat up fairly significantly, but you notice from Valerian beginning things in 257 to Valerian being captured and dying in 260, well, that's not a very long time. So it was fairly sharp, um, and they say in Numidia it was particularly intense, but it was also fairly short. So a brief window of time, persecution started relatively mild and then heated up, but then Valerian went into battle. Um, the Romans were outnumbered by the Persians, and so Valerian thought, well, it might be a good idea to have a conversation with them. Well, the Persians did not respect the rules of parley and went ahead and kidnapped Valerian from the parley. And you remember, we talked about um, not too long ago, in 247, Rome celebrated a thousand years of their empire. I don't believe that a Roman leader, you know, they're still not calling the emperors kings, they're calling them first citizens and that sort of thing. They've got all these ways of pretending that it's not a, a monarchic dictatorship. But I don't believe that anybody had been in the hands of a foreign power since Julius Caesar was captured by pirates. So this has been a long time, and you can imagine the blow I mean, what kind of a blow would it be for us if North Korea or China or whomever takes one of our senior officials, I mean, our most senior official captive? It's like, oh, that doesn't do much for national pride at any rate. This was almost unprecedented. <laughs> I see you, Pam, and I understand you. And I sympathize with you, but <laughs> in terms of, in terms of, how your nations are ranking, it's a blow to your pride, whatever else may also be true at the same time. So with the capture, and then the Persians killed him, with the capture and death of Valerian, he was followed by a fellow named Gallienus. And Gallienus looked around, he saw that things were not going well, I mean, that seems like an understatement, right? And he thought, you know, I'm gonna be better off having the loyalty of the Christians who, there's places, I mean, there were villages in North Africa that were claiming to be 100% Christians with no non-Christians even living there. Do you want that whole growing and increasingly wealthy and prosperous body of people against you at a time when the empire is in dangerous situations? Or would you rather they be loyal citizens who pray for your well-being? Well, Gallienus <laughs> issued a rescript of toleration. It wasn't that Christianity could not still get you in trouble, um, depending on how in your face you were about your profession of Christianity and depending on what part of the world you were in, but they weren't on the prowl anymore. They weren't finding bishops and punishing them for being bishops or anything like that. And in fact, it's around this time that you start to get bishops weighing in on matters of public interest. And of course, we may not necessarily think that that was, on the whole, a tremendously positive development. 
Um, ministers have lots of opinions, but it doesn't mean that their opinions vis-a-vis -vis policy or particular national problems are exceptionally valuable or worthy to be listened to. But as leading men, as influential people, the bishops started to weigh in on a lot of these things. Now you may notice I'm skipping a little bit here, like we haven't talked too much about Dionysius of Alexandria or the condemnation of Paul of Samosata that you see there. Um, part of the reason for that is that we will need to trace, hopefully fairly briefly, the doctrinal controversies within the church that related, specifically at this time, of course, to Christology. And so we're going to come back to kind of the background of the Arian conflict and its resolution, or its theoretical resolution at the Council of Nicaea. So when you see things on there that we're not talking about, don't get too worried. Um, it's not my plan to skip Paul of Samosata or controversy between Dionysius of Rome and Dionysius of Alexandria altogether. Just think it might be a little easier to, to manage if we talk about the doctrinal controversies altogether, and then we can compare and contrast the different positions. So let me just say this about um, the controversy between Dionysius of Rome and Dionysius of Alexandria. They each accused the other of unorthodoxy with regard to Christology, and I'm not prepared to say that there was zero unorthodoxy on either side, but part of it at least was a significant misunderstanding about vocabulary. You see, they both used the word hypostasis, which is a Greek word that means to stand under. If you break it into its component parts, that's its etymology, is to stand under. Well, in the Latin-speaking West, hypostasis would get translated by substance. And so basically it would sound as though it were synonymous with nature. So when people in the West heard people in the East speak about three hypostases, they're panicking. They're thinking, why have these people embraced the nonsensical notion that there's three divine natures? Now, in the East, hypostasis was used where we would use person. So when they hear the West saying there's one hypostasis and using the term persona, person, for what is three in God, they thought they were all modalists. That there's one divine essence, but God has three different masks that he switches out. Part of this was just a translation issue. If persona in Greek equals prosopon, or persona in Latin equals prosopon in Greek, then prosopon was used for a face, but it was also used for a mask, like the actors would use when they were performing different roles in the theater. Well, is the Trinity a doctrine that God has three masks, three modes or faces that he presents to the world? And so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not personally distinct. They're just God in three different moods or three different stages of activity or something like that. Well, that's what the East heard when the West used persona, and vice versa. What the West heard when the East used hypostases was three gods, which naturally made them panic a little bit, because it's very clear that we believe in one God, but a God who's not monadical, a God in which there's genuinely a way that you can speak of God as being three, without denying the unity of the essence. <clears throat> so, I'm not saying that was the entirety of the controversy between the two Dionysuses, but that vocabulary trouble did not help. And it's probably a helpful reminder for us, you know, you can't just pay attention to the words that people use, you also have to figure out what do they mean by those words. Um, even years later, um, in medieval Paris, Richard of St. Victor did not like the word hypostasis. He thought it contained a secret poison. Well, lots of Orthodox people have used it. I'm using it right now. And it actually is a biblical word. But misunderstandings were created. Okay. Uh, so far, questions, comments, concerns, anxieties? 
accusations of heresy, tritheism, modalism. <laughs> okay. Tritheism, of course, is the idea that the Trinity means there's three gods. Modalism is the idea that the Father, Son, and Spirit are not actually different persons. It's just different angles or aspects or sides. That's modalism, a different mode in which God appears and works. All right. Um, and Paul of Samosada had some Christological misfortunes. We'll come, we'll come back to him later on. Now, under Aurelian and under his successors, the empire got back on track. Speaking in terms of territory, there were other issues going on. For instance, they found um, caches of coins that people were burying like crazy in the 200s. The reason people were doing that is that the coins were constantly being debased. In other words, currency devaluation is not new. Um, originally, the main coin, the number one coin that was used, the Antonianus, had about 40% silver in it. Over time, that declined to 15%, and then that declined to 2%. While nominally, the face value of the coin remained the same. But really, the value of the coin was much, much, much less. So there were a lot of that sort of issue facing the Roman Empire as well. Problems that seem surprisingly modern when you start digging into it. We don't devalue our currency by diminishing the silver quantity, but that has been done before. And of course, we have other ways of devaluing currency. Um, and of course, these days when most of it is completely fictitious, you know, it's just numbers in a spreadsheet somewhere. It's very easy to devalue currency. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's an astonishing system where as long as we all keep pretending, it will be okay. But if enough people stop pretending, it's, wow. Anyway, I don't want the currency to be devalued in a, in a bad way, personally. But the empire was facing those problems. But with strong generals, with strong leadership, they were able to recover their territory. They were able to push back the barbarian invaders. Although even that story is more complicated. A lot of what they did in terms of pushing them back, was actually bringing them in, welcoming them, and basically turning them into Romans versus kicking them to the other side of the river. And as all of this is happening, with all the ups and downs of the empire, people are turning to Christianity. Now, when you read about the records of what happened, I think you get two main impressions, and one is bigger than the other. One big impression is that there was a sort of a revival going on. The preaching of the gospel was enjoying considerable success. The other impression is that people were turning away from an empire with all kinds of problems to something more stable, something more steady. Now, those things can go together. Um, people are genuinely converted even when you can see things in the background, in the thinking, that are not necessary for genuine conversion. So, for instance, to anchorize came to mean to run away into the desert and become a monk, but it also came to mean to get out from under the thumb of the tax man. Well, I don't think we should conclude that everybody who became a monk in order to avoid paying taxes was necessarily insincere. I, I don't think we should conclude that everybody was 100% sincere either. Human beings are complicated critters, and more things than one can be true. Um, although politically the empire, or territorially the empire was being restored, it's very telling. There were peasants who'd go to an oracle in Fayum, and they'd ask questions for guidance, and one of the questions they would ask, should I become a beggar? That was a big thing in people's minds. There's extensive records of people coming and raising that very question of the oracle. Should I become a beggar? Well, that kind of tells you that economically, at any rate, the empire was not doing tremendously great. We often have questions. We seek guidance on multiple points. But I would imagine for most of us the question, should I become a beggar? has not really been one that we've brought up in a serious way. 
But that was the financial situation, especially that people who didn't have land were facing at this time. So you think about the growth of Christianity, and I think you can see multiple factors. You can see the decline of what people used to trust in. You can see the rise into greater prominence and greater social acceptability and greater prosperity of the church as a whole. You can also see the steadfastness of martyrs, the activity of missionaries, the work of the Holy Spirit. Is it possible then that there were false conversions? Absolutely. Is it possible that there were people who misunderstood Christianity and clung to it because they thought that it was a newer, more up-to-date, better version of the sort of prosperity gospel of the old Roman religion, where you did your service to the gods, and they kept your family safe, and they made your crops grow? Yeah, that's also possible. We shouldn't discount that, but nor should we exaggerate that. Even when people come to the church with that kind of false thinking in mind, many times it does get corrected in the process of discipleship. Even if that's an element in people's thinking at the beginning, or even if that perseveres, it doesn't mean that there's no element of spiritual understanding of actual trust in Christ for justification, forgiveness of sins, and acceptance by God. Now, it behooves us, it's to our advantage, to be very clear about these things. There's always a risk of us turning our Christianity into a folk religion. And of course, to the degree that that happens, we lose the actual value of Christianity. But since Christianity is a faith for all of life, since the Lord cares for us in both body and soul, it's not as easy as just saying, well, Christianity is only about life after death, about salvation from sin, and here in this world we need other sources of security or stability or comfort or what have you. So the challenge that we have as Christians is to relate our faith to every aspect of life, even the details, I mean, whether the crops grow or not, it's not exactly a detail, but you understand what I mean, even things that non-Christians are involved in and care about, how do we relate our faith to that without reducing our faith to that? And this is, this is a challenge the church has faced, continues to face, will always face, and there are always some who fall into one of the two mistakes. They either dissociate Christianity from ordinary life, or they reduce Christianity to health and prosperity here and now. Both of those are very dangerous mistakes. But the Lord uses people who have tendencies in both directions to spread the gospel more widely, and the Lord calls people with tendencies in both directions into his church. So what I'm saying is we should be very charitable to people who seem to have a somewhat deficient understanding of one way or another, but with regard to ourselves, we should be supremely careful that we're not turning Christianity into a folk religion, but also that we're not failing to relate Christianity to every element of our lives. Okay, now that probably left some confusions or questions in people's minds, so I'll stop talking for a moment and give opportunity for comments, concerns, <laughs> considerations. David? What's a folk religion? A folk religion is a technical term for <clears throat> when you have a, a popular religion, it's something that people are involved in, it's something that people are engaged with, but it's not necessarily related to their day-to-day -day concerns. In other words, there's people who think that God is for the big stuff, but for the daily stuff, I need to talk to the local witch doctor, or get in touch with the spirit world, or put out good vibrations, or what have you. So there's, there's actually more than one, but there's a very good book about understanding folk religion. And it's not, it's not an issue that's unique to Christianity. Um, all religions have this, but of course it's particularly acute in the case of Christianity for Christians, because if that's all your religion is, if 
you're not in contact with God on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't seem like you're actually getting the teaching of the Bible anywhere near right. Give us this day our daily bread. A lot of times, um, folk religion is about what works here and now. What guarantees me a good yield on my crops? What guarantees the health of my children? What? And that's where the prosperity gospel is basically a folk religion version of Christianity. They've <coughs> forgotten all of the bigger concerns. They've forgotten the kingdom of God, and they've turned it into not pie in the sky by and by, but pie on a plate here and now. <laughs> folk religion is about pie on a plate. Well, if we have pie, the Lord provided it. I'm not denying that. But that's not what it's all about. And I'm not going to do whatever it takes to get pie on the plate, even if that means relegating the Lord only to some vague realm after death. You know, this comes up with the way that people view, view the ministry and the pastor. Does the pastor live at the church and the cemetery and the hospital? Sometimes. <laughs> well, well, obviously there are weeks, yes, there are weeks. Um, but the sphere of my work is not confined to when people are getting baptized or attending worship or almost dead or all the way dead. That's not the only time that I'm relevant. I, I'm sorry, I hope this doesn't sound like I'm, I'm fussing or complaining about your reception of me or anything like that or insisting on my own importance. But if you genuinely, truly believe that the Lord provides for us in body and soul, that he's our only comfort in life and in death, then you don't need your minister only when there's a baptism or a wedding or a funeral or a hospitalization. The interaction, the shepherding, the praying should be a lot wider than that. Um, anybody who thinks, you know, that, that I do baptisms, weddings, and funerals, you're paying for a lot more than you're getting. Let me put it that way. Because <laughs> a lot more is available. Did, did that answer your question, David? Okay, very good. And I think, Eric, you were going to put your hand up? No. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Considerations about any of that? Well, it's just like you were mentioning. I don't I mean, it's not Christ plus, but that's what that is. It's like, well, this is good to, a good starting place, yes. but we need all these other. Yes, and it's interesting. There's kind of a dynamic, you know, where on the one hand, folk religion is very much focused on the here and now. It's not that they deny everything else, but they just they kind of push God off into only being concerned with that. And part of the reason people do that is that they feel like God is not working out for them. Well. That is where the rubber meets the road for us. We're trusting in God. We're praying. We're looking to him. We're asking for his blessing. Is he coming through for us? Well, if your mindset is worldly and God doesn't come through, you might not turn your back on him completely. You might just you know, leave him as a, something to be dealt with after death and in the meantime turn to whatever works here and now. But from a more heavenly-minded perspective, you would say, no, the Lord has a purpose in these things that are not working out. And so you would relate the frustrations, the disappointments, the griefs and sorrows of everyday life to the bigger concerns of the kingdom of God, your eternal salvation, and the rest. We've got to bridge the gap. Sociologists of religion will talk about a middle story. You know, lots of people think about God, high up, far away, death, in the remote distance. Now, for today's immediate, everyday practical concerns, how do I get help? How do I get protected from evil spirits? How do I ensure the rains and all the rest of that? And so a lot of people, even professing Christian people, will turn to the middle story. Um, they'll turn to witch doctors or what have you. Now, perhaps somewhat less so in Western societies, but even in Western societies, then the temptation is to depend on technology and technological manipulation of things. Or you still have people who read their horoscopes every day. 
even though the horoscope is generally assigned to the newest intern at the newspaper. Not because they have any particular psychic gifts, but because nobody else wants the job of writing those deadly boring horoscopes. Yes, sir? Seems very much like you're speaking to the Lord's Day that we read today, yeah. idolatry. Yes. That's really what you're getting on. Yes. Yes, when it criticizes all of those, other, why do people turn to those other things? Because they feel like somehow God is not working out for them. He's failed. He's failed, He's failed them. us. Yes. And when we do that, we're basically raising the question, what is God for? And we're saying God is for the purpose of my own greater convenience. When you say, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, things have not worked out the way I want. I wonder what the Lord is doing in my life. Now you've got things in the better perspective. What are you for? What purpose do you serve? Well, you serve to glorify God, and God is at work in the frustrations and disappointments as well as in the triumphs and the successes of your life. We've got to hold all of that together. And people in the church, I'm not saying the church as a whole has, has failed in that, you know, like in doctrinal pronouncements or anything like that. But for us, as individuals leading our lives, it is not easy to not go to one extreme or the other. Either we think of God as irrelevant to day-to-day -day life and we become practically deists. God wound the world up like a clock, let it go, now he's no longer involved, which is wrong. Or we fall into God as our gopher. <coughs> yes, sir? I've kind of experienced one in Chicago in our mission work when a lady called me and my brothers in Mexico are Christian and they are prosperous. And I would like to come to your church. I said, sure, come. She came, she was greatly disappointed because we didn't have you know, streams and things like that. But her priority was not the gospel. And you know, she was very disappointed that we didn't have all of that. She didn't care for the teaching. She didn't care for the instruction of God's word. But again, you know, her priority was different. What's not God's purpose for her, but her own purpose? Yes, you you run into that a lot. Wherever there's a sense that we serve the Lord and will automatically flourish and prosper and grow and become big and powerful, etc. Wherever there's that kind of triumphalism, not understanding that we must, through many tribulations, enter into the kingdom of God, you increase the risk of people taking things. Well, I think that did happen historically, but I'm also grateful for those who witnessed against it. Um, that has brought us up to the accession of Diocletian, and since he's going to be the one who launched the last great persecution against Christians at the Roman Empire, I think we can probably leave it for there until <coughs> next time. Any final questions, comments, concerns? All right, then let's wrap up with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the instruction that comes to us as we consider what your church has experienced, debated, and done, and suffered in times past. We pray that you would be with those who are suffering today. Strengthen them, Lord. Equip them to give a good answer, even for those who would like them to change their profession. And we ask that you would bring speedy deliverance to those who are being persecuted for the cause of Christ. We pray that you would help us, Lord, also, not only in preaching and teaching, though certainly there, but also in our individual lives. May we know that you are a God for all of life. May we call upon you in the day of trouble. May we turn to you with every request from our daily bread to the salvation of our souls and the bringing in of the new heavens and the new earth. May every concern be brought to you. But, oh, Lord, we pray also that we would not think of you as a genie or a talisman to guarantee success, but as our sovereign God who guides us in sometimes mysterious roads for his own greater and more glorious purposes. And thus, oh, Lord, may we accept disappointment, <coughs> frustration, sorrow, difficulty, as also coming to us from your fatherly hand and as things that will be overruled for our true and everlasting good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
If you didn't get a study guide for James chapter 1, there are some on the back table, and I look forward to seeing those who are able to on Wednesday. And if you're able to join us at Chu at Roland Living, we're happy to see you there as well.